Okay, welcome back. So we've discussed the history of IV fluids and oral rehydration therapy. We've looked a little bit at the physiology of ORT. Now let's go on and look at some clinical conditions where ORT can be very helpful in our patients. The first one we'll look at is parvovirus. And this is a disease literally that plagues our patients from time to time. I think all of us dread the, the smell and uh, dread dealing with these patients. They can be quite difficult. But my secret weapon to dealing with parvovirus is ORT and a nasogastric tube. I, whenever possible, place a nasogastric tube in the patients, running it down from the nose to the stomach. I prefer nasogastric rather than nasoesophageal. And we need to radiograph it to make sure that it is securely in the stomach and that it's not uh, just nasoesophageal and that it's not kinked up somewhere. So radiographs are important to check the position. And once we're sure that it's in the stomach, that lets us do two things. It lets us suction out the tremendous volume of gastric secretions that develops in parvovirus. Even, even small patients, five, eight kilo puppies, I've seen them give me 50, 60 mils of gastric juice every couple hours. And it's a spectacular volume. And all it does is slosh around in their stomach and make them feel nauseous. So by using a nasogastric tube to suction out those secretions every couple of hours, the patients are in fact a lot more comfortable and their requirement for antiemetics is much, much less. After the gastric secretions are suctioned out, then we the next step is to put in some microenteral nutrition. And here's where I start with a product like Oraloid, using a, a very small volume, just half a mil per kilo every couple hours. But we go on from there and build it up over the next few days. Does this do any good? Well, yes. So the study done by Moore was done in 2003 and they took 30 consecutive parvovirus patients and divided them up into one of two treatment groups. The first group was given what we consider fairly ordinary treatment in terms of IV fluids, antiemetics, antibiotics and then we're just allowed to rest their gastrointestinal tract until such time as they had actually finished vomiting for at least 12 hours. And that length of time on average in the patients was more than 48 hours until such time as they were starting to be fed. Once they had stopped vomiting then they were hand fed for um, the next few days every four hours and the diet they were given was a low-fat solid food. The second group of patients was handled differently only in one respect in that within 12 hours of admission they had a nasoesophageal tube placed which through which was put a dilute solution of something like convalescent support and that was trickle fed through a continuous rate infusion. Now the investigators did all sorts of measurements over the six days of hospitalization. They measured uh, intestinal permeability, they measured weight gain, they measured um, body dehydration, and they also measured days in hospital, and they also did something that was a rather subjective wellness factor. And this graph is the one that shows body weight gain. And group one is here along the bottom. 
and you can see that they just creep up and gain a couple percents of body weight by the end of day six. Whereas group two that had the feeding have gained almost 10% of their body weight at the end of day six. And the second group had greatly improved intestinal barrier function, which is one of the key points of providing ORT and enteral nutrition. Let's go on and look at pancreatitis, which is another common problem. Sometimes pancreatitis is just a little blip on the radar where a, a dog ate something that, uh, that it shouldn't have, but sometimes it can go on and be quite serious and cause the patient to be in the hospital down and out for three, four, five days and uh, quite often, sometimes a week. And patients do die of pancreatitis. The classic strategies have been to either rest the gut completely and give them nothing by mouth and rest the pancreas or another strategy that's been used is to give them parenteral nutrition in by delivering lipids, carbohydrates, amino acids, and electrolytes through an IV catheter. And that's a bit of a project, but both of those things have been tried. Resting the gut has been shown not to work very well, and IV feeding by itself has been shown not to work very well. There's a nice study done at Tufts University in Massachusetts a few years ago and they've got a pretty heavy-duty nutritional support program there so they looked back at the records and they had a 20, 127 dogs and cats that had been on partial parenteral nutrition. Now this is partial in terms of the fact that the patients were not receiving 100 percent of their caloric requirements but they were receiving a balance of lipids, carbohydrates, amino acids, and electrolytes. And they found that the survival rate of the patients that received IV feeding only was 68 percent. About a quarter of the patients though had also been receiving enteral nutrition and that could be by either tube feeding or being or by being hand fed and the survival rate on those patients no matter how much they got and, and in some patients it wasn't very much but the survival rate improved by 20 percent up to a sur total survival rate of 89 percent and that's at a significance value of p equals 0 0.02 so that's a pretty solid finding and uh, is a big strike against just strictly IV feeding. Now why is that? Because you have to nourish the enterocytes. Without that, the enteral bacteria, without a good gastrointestinal barrier, the enteral bacteria, who should be staying inside the gut, creep along over the wall into the capillary circulation and then make their way into the systemic circulation and literally create sepsis. So even patients who are on TPN now for severe reasons like uh, severe conditions like oncology or, or burns and those sorts of things, they are still getting ORT alongside of that treatment. And that's the current thinking. Let's look at another condition that happens to us all, and that's patients who have had gastrointestinal surgery. And this is a nice case. He was a four-year-old Weimariner. He had been out camping with his family for a few days, and he had been off his food and vomiting a bit. And um, they were up in the wilds of Scotland, so they finally managed to get him to a local vet who correctly diagnosed uh, gastrointestinal foreign body 
performed a laparotomy and had to reset some of the bowel to remove the plastic bag and performed an end-to-end -end anastomosis. But after a few days, uh, the Weimariner still wasn't picking up like he should have been, and so he was referred to our hospital, where ultrasound confirmed a diagnosis of peritonitis, and so he went straight back to theater, where a repeat exploratory laparotomy was done, and the anastomosis had broken down. And that happens to any of us, and... Uh, it happens to the best of us, and I'm sure it's happened to you. So what do we do about it? Well, after he got it at the time of surgery, he had two Jackson Pratt drains placed, which are key to managing these patients. I thought the other key to draining, to, to improving these patients is, besides draining the nastiness, we have to provide some oral nutrition. So this dog got a nasogastric tube placed because certainly he doesn't want to eat. And he's got all the rest of the bells and whistles on him as well. And I'll sh let me just show you what we have done to him. He had a triple lumen central venous catheter in his jugular vein. This mesh is holding his peritoneal drain bags. He's got a urinary catheter in so that we can monitor his fluid output. He's got ECG sticky pads on his feet. And I think that's about it. And he's got his nasogastric tube. So he's well and truly what I call wired for sound. But he needed it because these patients have lots and lots of issues. First of all, they have ileus, their gastrointestinal tract has had a hard week and it does not want to play ball at all. So it'll just sit there and uh, pout, honestly, for as long as you'll let it. So you have to nudge it back into action gently, gently, gently. These patients are also nauseous and they have a lot of abdominal pain the requirements for analgesics can be quite substantial. They're generally in decreased body condition because they've been anorexic for so long and certainly they don't want to eat in order to make themselves better. They're certainly with peritonitis they also become hyperproteinemic because they're losing so much serum through their abdominal fluid and that creates another set of problems because we're trying to heal surgical wounds with a short supply of albumin. So nasogastric feeding is key to these patients. Again, I use the same strategy that I use with the parvo patients in that I suction out the gastrointestinal sludge every few hours and then start with half a mil per kilo of oral aid every two hours. I'll put it in an IV drip bag if I can, but quite often we just push it in slowly every few hours. And I'll talk more in a little minute about how how to ramp that up and, and make the transition to other products. Diesel, this dog did finally walk away and it took about five days but I can tell you that the entire hospital, including myself, applauded when he finally showed us that his gastrointestinal tract had returned to normal function. By this time his nasogastric tube was out and I think he went home the next day after this when we pulled his abdominal drains. So that was a good outcome and everybody was pretty happy but you can still see how much weight he lost here over the week that he was in the hospital. It was actually closer to 10 days for the whole episode. Now let's not forget cats. Cats are patients too and they're notoriously inappetent in the hospital and uh, certainly nobody likes to force feed them. I bet we've all got the scratches on our hands to prove that. So cats benefit a lot from having a nasogastric tube placed 
or sometimes in a esophagostomy tube. Uh, esophagostomy tube should be a minimum of 14 French diameter for an adult cat and that gives you a lot of flexibility because it doesn't irritate their nose it can stay in for days to weeks if necessary and you can put just about any kind of uh, critical care diet through that tube. One of the tricks we use to get the cat started though is to just freeze a few freeze an ice cube tray full of oroid and give them a couple blocks at a time to drink so that we're not having to use the whole bottle on one cat. Let the, let's just share it out amongst the patients, which is a nice thing to be able to do. Let's now talk about how you can implement ORT in your practice and how it might look on your patients. The first thing you all have to decide is how high you're going to set the bar. You have to decide how long it's acceptable for a patient to be anorexic. And there was a recent study from the University of Edinburgh Veterinary School that said at least half of the dogs and cats that were referred to their internal medicine service were recognizably underweight on the basis of their body score and owner history. And yes, I know that's a referral place, but I think m many times, more often than we think, that it's true that our patients have already been anorexic for two or three days before they come to us and before they enter the hospital. So my recommendation is that you start on day one, supplementing interval feeding or rehydration with your patients and don't go home at night without having a feeding plan in place for every patient. How much should that be? The basic plot is to start with oral aid, half a mil per kilo, by mouth, every couple hours. And through the night, okay, that can be a little less, maybe every four hours. But that's sort of a background level that's not a volume big enough to, to contribute to their vomiting. And if they do well on that for the first 8 to 12 hours, then I'll take it up by 50% in 8 hour blocks over the next couple days. Do I use antiemetics on patients? I guess I'll use antiemetics on outpatients. The average gastro vomiting and diarrhea dog, yes, he'll get one injection of Serenia. But patients that I admit who aren't quite so well, I actually don't give them antiemetics at first because I do want to see just how much vomiting they are doing and make sure that we're not masking any significant clinical signs. So this is how a treatment schedule might look for a border collie and an outpatient. Let's say he shows up on Friday at 5 o'clock with vomiting and diarrhea and it's been going on for a couple days. The first thing I do is check his PCV and total solids and a BUN stick to make sure that he's not dehydrated or azotemic. And assuming those things were within normal limits, then I'd, I'd probably talk to the owners and figure out a plan for him to go home with. And that plan for a 20 kilo dog would start with 10 mils of oral aid every two hours, nothing else by mouth, no water, no nothing. And you're going, okay, the dog's vomiting, he's got di diarrhea, and we're going to give him just a ridiculously small amount of fluid. Yes, that's true, for 12 hours and then we're going to ramp it up. Let's say we make it through the night without any explosions of nasty diarrhea and no more mega vomiting and then we take the oral aid up to 15 mils every couple hours. Carry that on with that through the day and by tea time he can have a spoonful of chicken and I mean one spoonful, one teaspoon 
No ID, no cups, no half bowls, no nothing, just one teaspoon of cooked chicken. And we're increasing the oral weight up to about 25 mils now. And if we make it through Saturday night uh, without any issues, then by Sunday morning we're pretty much ready to start letting him have all the oral aid he wants and have a couple more spoons of chicken every few hours and he'll be off and running. If at any point in this process the patient becomes uh, develops persistent vomiting or develops black or bloody diarrhea then they're asked to come back into the clinic and will be hospitalized on IV fluids and oral aid. So what steps do you need to take in order to start implementing ORT and early enteral nutrition in your practice? I think the first thing you need to do is to write out a protocol so that everybody in your hospital agrees on what you're going to do with quote unquote outpatient gastro dogs and I found it quite helpful to sketch out a bit of a timeline table like I showed you so that the owners know exactly what volumes they're t to give at what point and to make sure that they understand what the cutout points are as well. Secondly, you'll need to increase awareness amongst your staff within the hospital of inpatient nutrition and it really helps here if you can nominate one person to be the nutrition project manager because it's like implementing change with in, in any organization it really needs somebody to get behind it and to keep everybody else aware of the implementation and to help everybody sort out the problems and develop some new habits. The next thing I do is suggest that you get some oral aid in stock and uh, maybe a few other critical care feeding products as well. Get some uh, appropriately sized nasogastric and nasoesophageal tubes in stocks and learn how to use them. And last but not least, make sure that nutrition intake is noted on the patient's chart. Not just what they were offered, but how much they actually ate. And I'm sure, like, like me, you've uh, picked up patient charts sometimes and found that uh, actually all they've had to eat in the hospital for the last three days was one spoon of ID. And that's just not enough. We need to improve that. So those are some basic strategies for implementing these ideas in your practice. So we've covered the background, we've covered the physiology, we've covered some good examples of clinical conditions and, and how ORT and early enteral nutrition could be used, and we've got some ideas for implementation. I'd just like to show you this video of a dog drinking oral aid. <laughs> and yes, he's a Labrador. I know he's a Labrador, but still, <laughs> it's pretty good. So with that in mind, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much for your attention and your attendance today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me and uh, the, presenter, the other presenters can tell you how to get a hold of me. Thank you very much.